Well, we have seen something of what John is about with the study of his prologue, and we have seen also uh, something of the testimony of John Baptist, and that leads us into the first disciples who followed Jesus. And we take it up at verse 35. Next day again, John was standing and a couple of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Look, the Lamb of God. And his two disciples heard him speaking and followed Jesus. There's a touch or two of vividness about this. We see John standing and he, his piercing look at Jesus as Jesus walked. And then he greeted him as uh, the Lamb of God. Well, I already shared my puzzlement with you about that expression this morning, so we will uh, not go into it further this afternoon. Uh, the two disciples apparently heard him say just that one sentence, Look, the Lamb of God. He didn't say, Follow him or anything like that, but they did. They followed Jesus. And it is a mark of how well John had done his work that they did precisely that. John had been teaching them that the Great One, the Messiah, would come. John had been teaching that his function was no more than to point men to Jesus. And so when Jesus came and he greeted him as the Lamb of God, they were so well instructed that they went right off immediately. Let us not miss this further note of the greatness of John Baptist. We saw this morning that he was a very humble man, and this comes out in this place yet once more. It isn't very easy when you are trying to do something worthwhile in this world to gather followers around you. All of us who work in the Church of God know that all too well. But having got them, then it is much harder to say, leave me. I can't take you any further. You go along with him. He will take you along the way you should go. But it was a mark of the greatness of John that he could and did do just that. He turned his own followers away from himself. He was not the light. And he knew it. He came to bear witness of the light. And he bore that witness. And as uh, I say, he bore it so well that when the moment came, there was no problem. The two left John and followed Jesus. But if they knew that they must leave John and go after the Messiah, that apparently was about all they did know. In verse 38, And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means being interpreted teacher, where are you staying? And he said, come and you'll see. I detect a note of shyness and uncertainty here. And John had told them that they must go after Jesus, but he couldn't tell them more than that. John didn't know what would be required of them when they came to the Messiah. And so they followed Jesus, all right? They, 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 the instructions up to that point. But when Jesus said, what do you want? They didn't know. They'd follow John, and John said, follow him, and that's what they did. And so they, they stumbled out this, where are you staying? What has that got to do with anything? It's a, I guess it was something, it was a, some kind of answer to what he'd said. But I detect a, a note of uncertainty here. They, they didn't know where they should go from this point. They were not yet used to the thought that they had found the Messiah. Just in passing, notice that they addressed Jesus as Rabbi, and John explains what that means. It's a, a word which, when you translate it, 
means teacher. Uh, teacher, of course, is its normal equivalent. It isn't an exact rendering of it. Rabbi is a very much like the French, Monsieur, my great one. But uh, it was addressed traditionally among the Jews to teach it. Traditionally, t- perhaps takes it back too far. Uh, nobody knows quite when they started talk- talking about their teachers as rabbi, but it was uh, by this time clearly. And so they greeted Jesus as rabbi, as teacher, and asked him where he was staying. Well, he said to them, come, and you'll see. Well, that was an invitation to them, and they accepted it. They came, therefore, and they saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. Uh, The hour was about the tenth. There are some people, Westcott, for example, who wrote one of the greatest comedies on this gospel, who think of uh, the tenth hour as following what Westcott calls the Roman system of time. And that would make it about ten on our reckoning, ten in the morning. Uh, The other view is that they followed the normal Jewish custom and counted the hours from sunrise. And the tenth hour, counting the sun getting up at around six, would be about four in the afternoon. Now, Westcott makes quite a bit here and there in this gospel of the use of the Roman system of time. And in a way, I wish I could go with him because it would solve a a problem which arises later on in the time of the crucifixion. If we could accept the Roman time there, it would make things far simpler. But as far as I am able, I have looked at this problem and I haven't found anybody who used the so-called Roman system of time. Uh, This system counted from midnight to midnight exactly as we do. But as far as I can find out, it was used only in legal documents. Now, if a lease finishes on such and such a day, then you had to know when that day finished. Was it sunrise? Was it sunset? When? There had to be a time when, for legal purposes, a day was thought either to begin or to end. And the Romans solved that problem by putting it safely in the middle of the night when people ought to be home in bed asleep anyway. And so it didn't affect life all that much. But I cannot find any evidence that anybody ever counted time in the hours from midnight. For instance, on Roman sundials which have been excavated, midday is always marked by a six. Never, so I am told, by a twelve. And if one reads through Latin literature, the hours of the day are counted from sunrise as with other people. So I think this ought to be taken uh, from sunrise, and this means that they came to Jesus late in the day. And I think that they stayed there with him means then that they stayed overnight. They wanted to have a good long talk with Jesus. They couldn't get by very quickly, and so they came and they stayed with him. Now, if that is so, we have another interesting thing about this, uh, the way the fourth gospel begins. Uh, We will have then the equivalent of seven days which the gospel opens with. Remember in Genesis, in the beginning God created heaven and the earth, and you have seven days of creation. Now, this gospel begins with the same expression in our in beginning was the word, which seems a conscious a reference to Genesis. And then when we get out of the prologue, uh, verse 19 gives us the testimony of John and certain things happening about then. That's the first day. And in verse 29, the next day, he sees Jesus going. That's the second day. Verse 35, next day, and that brings us up to day three. Where we are right now, they stay overnight. That puts us on to day four. Verse 43, uh, the next day, it puts us on to verse on to day five, and chapter two begins with on the third day, which by the Jewish method of counting takes us on to day seven, the fifth day, the sixth day, and then the seventh day. So we have, uh, it appears, seven days to start this gospel. And if this is the right way to understand it, then I think the question arises, 
Why does John bring in this seven days of creation motive as he begins? And the answer that I myself would give is because he's talking about creation. He's talking about the new creation that comes about in Christ Jesus. Uh, for John, it was tremendously important that Jesus makes all things new. And so he has this subtle way of alluding at the creativity of Christ as he begins. And of course, from that third day in chapter 2, he goes right on into the story of the changing of the water into wine, uh, which I think must be understood as one of John's significant signs, significant signs. It was a way of showing that there is a transforming power in Christ. He takes the, if you like, the water of Judaism and transforms it into the wine of Christianity. And so he's, uh, he's bringing out in this uh, unobtrusive way the fact of Christ's creating work. Well now, uh, getting back again to these disciples, um, they stayed there throughout that day, and in verse 40 we read that uh, uh, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, was one of the two who heard from John and followed him. Andrew is named by reference to his brother Simon. Simon hasn't turned up in the gospel yet, but in the Christian church, Simon was the, well and widely known, and so Andrew is designated with reference to his more famous brother. Uh, Andrew is, um, is marked as quite a number of the minor characters are in this gospel, with a certain consistency. Every time we meet him, he's bringing someone to Jesus. And so here he goes off after his brother. Um, there is a lot of value in consistency. And, of course, we are all inspired by Andrew with the urgency of bringing others to a knowledge of Jesus. An interesting question arises as to who the other one was. And John doesn't tell us. But from very early days in the church, it has been held that Andrew's companion was none other than the beloved disciple. Um, I see no way of proving it, equally no way of disproving it. Uh, but if this were the beloved disciple, it would explain some things. It would explain, for instance, why he doesn't mention himself. Um, he doesn't say who it was, but if he was the one in question, that is quite understandable. Of course, one of the great problems of this gospel is that the Apostle John is never mentioned. And if the beloved disciple were the Apostle John, this would fit into to place too. Yet another interesting omission in this gospel is the name of, uh, of Jesus' mother. He refers to the, the mother of Jesus, but never calls her Mary. However, strictly that's out of our province because that doesn't come to chapter 2. So I just point out that there are some curious omissions in this gospel, and they sometimes present us with problems. But the omission of the name of Andrew's companion possibly is explained if he was the author of the gospel. Well now, let's get back to Andrew. And in verse 41, this man first finds his own brother Simon and says to him, We have found the Messiah, which is, being translated, Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Um, it's not quite certain what the first means. This man first found his own brother Simon. Uh, there are different readings in the uh, in the Greek, and uh, one of them uh, could well be rendered, he was the first to find his own brother. The implication would be that the other guy also went off and found his brother. Um, or it could mean that Andrew found Simon first, before he did anything else. Or it could mean that Andrew found Simon first before he found anybody else. So there are 
those three distinct meanings. As a matter of fact, there's a fourth one that depends on a different reading, which a number of translators, like Moffat and Schoenfield, for instance, adopt, uh, namely that there's a word fairly similar to first, which means in the morning. And so they would take it to mean that the next morning, first thing in the morning, Andrew got cracking on the job of finding somebody for Jesus. Um, I would like to adopt that. That would uh, make quite clear my seven days that I discern in this front part. But I think the evidence is against it and I have to reject it. Well, I think it means that Andrew, first, before he did anything else, went off and found his brother. It was important to Andrew that the one to whom John Baptist had sent them was none other than the Messiah. And so he must bring his brother. He must share this good news with Peter and the way he went to do it. Notice that the first reference of Messiah is followed by a translation. As I was pointing out this morning, Messiah is really a, a Hebrew word, uh, which we transliterate into English just to get this word Messiah. Well, the Messian in Greek is a transliteration of it into Greek. And the translation is Christos, which uh, we transliterate again into English and so get Christ. But John wants his readers to see that this curious Jewish word, Messian, can be understood. It's, uh, it is Christ, a familiar word in the Greek language. Um, Messiah, as a matter of fact, is not used very often in the New Testament. We much more often have Christ. But it is good to have the word introduced here and to have it translated in this way. We well, brought him to Jesus. And Archbishop William Temple, in his readings on the fourth gospel, puts in a characteristic little sentence, perhaps as great a service to the church as ever any man did. And that's worth stopping to reflect on, too. We think of Simon Peter as one of the really great Christian leaders, and so he was. The church in every age has owed a tremendous amount to the fact that this man, Simon, was one of the first followers of Jesus and a man of tremendous ability, and that he did a very great deal in the service of God. How would he have come to Jesus if it hadn't been for Andrew? It was Andrew who brought him to Jesus. And over and over and over in the history of the Christian church, this has happened. Behind every really great Christian leader, I think if you look hard enough, you can discern in the shadows some tiny more or less insignificant figure, but one who brought him to Jesus. And it's an encouragement to us all, surely, that while it does not fall to the lot of many of us to be great among God's servants, it does fall to the lot of many to be able to win someone for Christ anyway. And who can tell when that one turns out to do great things in the service of God. I find Andrew a, a tremendous encouragement. In fact, I find Peter a tremendous encouragement too, as we look on. In verse 42, he brought him to Jesus, and Jesus <clears throat> uh, looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Cephas, another piece of Aramaic, which has to be translated, which is translated Peter. Kephas is an Aramaic word meaning rock, and Petros is a Greek word meaning rock. And so, as Andrew brought his brother Simon to Jesus, Jesus took one look at him and said, Rock. The trouble with this is that we know Peter, and we know that he turned out to be a very great man, in the, in the service of God. So we take this quite calmly. This is the natural thing. But if you didn't know anything beyond the Gospels, if you didn't know what happened when the infant church got cracking, anything less like a rock than Peter, it would be hard to imagine. 
Well, he was up and down like a yo-yo. He, he, he might be very, very right. Or he might be very, very wrong. He's an interesting character. That I will grant you. Uh, there is no scene in which Peter appears which is uninteresting. Uh, he wasn't like so many of us. He couldn't make Christianity dull. But he was just as likely to be horribly wrong as he was to be gloriously right. Oh, when that time in Caesarea Philippi, when uh, Jesus asked who do men say, and Peter came out with that tremendous confession, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, and Peter was re rewarded by Jesus saying, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. Flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father in heaven. And then he went on to talk about his crucifixion, and Peter, Far be it from thee, Lord. In the space of two or three verses, there he is, from the height receiving the revelation of, from God and penetrating into what Jesus really was, to that place where Jesus had to say, Get behind me, you Satan. That's how Peter, he may be very, very right, or he may be very, very wrong, but very, very stable, a man who could be compared to a rock, Never, not right the way through the Gospels from start to finish. Go right along to the last chapter of John and he's still in that unstable kind of state. You know, the, the, the man who on the fishing boat, when he finds it's Jesus on the shore, will jump out and uh, swim ashore and leave the rest of them to bring the, the fish to land. And the one who, when Jesus restores him to the fellowship with the disciples, turns to the beloved disciple and says, Lord, what is this man going to do? And has Jesus saying, that's nothing to do with you, Peter. That's our Peter. But Jesus looked at him and said, you will be called rock. You see, Jesus was seeing him not so much as he was then, but as by God's grace he would become. And if instead of reading the the Gospels, we read the Acts and the Epistles, then we see the fulfillment of Christ's word. It is true that now and then we get this same vacillation. Remember in Galatians, Paul tells us that he had to resist Peter, he was wrong. But by and large, throughout that early church, Peter stands as a rock. Uh, he's a strong character. He's one to whom the others in the early church can look for a lead and not be disappointed. Uh, he is one who stands firm and goes right on with whatever work it is that God has given him to do. As I say, I find Andrew very encouraging because I'm just not up there with Peter. I'm just one of the little guys in the church and I feel that this is good. We are encouraged, all of us, by such a man as Andrew. But we are also encouraged by such a man as Peter. As Christ looks at you and at me, I think he sees us too, not only for what we are, but what, by God's grace, we might become. And so he looks for us to produce the utmost of our potential, not in our own strength, Peter couldn't do it that way, but by God's grace and by the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit and by the operation of God's providence on us, leading us day by day in the way in which we should go. Now, there, there is encouragement in both of these disciples. And so, for that matter, is there in the ones that follow. Let's have a look at them. Verse 43, the next day, he wanted to go out to Galilee, and he finds Philip. Uh, Grammatically, this could refer to Jesus, to Peter, but no doubt it does refer to Jesus. Jesus determined to go to Galilee, and he found Philip. Where he found Philip is not said. Some think that he found him there by Jordan where he was, and some think he determined to go to Galilee, he went to Galilee, and that's where he found him. Uh, it is not said. What is said is that he found him, and Jesus said to him, Follow me. Notice that Philip takes no initiative in this matter. It's a bit different from the earlier ones. See, Jesus up to this point hasn't done anything very much. Uh, the first two followed him. 
he found them following him and he said, what are you looking for? And that led on. And then Andrew went off and found his brother and brought him in. So that Jesus, so to speak, is, is there, ready to receive the people as they come to him. But that's all. But not so with Philip. Uh, Jesus went out after Philip. And that represents a difference which may be significant. Uh, I may have it all wrong, but I think Philip was a man who was pretty limited. I recall once many long years ago hearing a bishop of the church say, Philip was apparently a rather stupid man. Well, I'm not a bishop of the church, and so I don't say that. <laughs> but he did have his limitations. Have you noticed? Every time we meet Philip, he's out of his depth. Here it is the first time. Presently he'll go along to Nathaniel and say, we found the one of whom Moses and the law wrote and the prophets, Jesus of Nazareth. And, and Nathaniel says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Now, how do you answer that? Philip didn't know. So he said kind of helplessly, come and see for yourself. I guess on the whole that was as good an answer as he could have gotten, but I doubt that Philip went through all the possible answers and came up with that one. I think he was just puzzled. He didn't know his way around it. Turns up again with the feeding of the 5,000, and there are all the people there, and they haven't got anything to, to eat. I don't know why this makes me feel, think of lunch, but that's the way it is. And <laughs> Jesus says to Philip, you come from this part, Philip. You're from Bethsaida. Tell me, how are we going to feed all this group of people in the wilderness? And Philip said, if we had 200 denarii, which we haven't, <laughs> and if we spent it all on buying bread, no bread shop here, we couldn't give everyone a taste. That's Philip's contribution to the solution of the problem. <laughs> uh, Jesus goes on to the other things and the people get fed, but there's our Philip. And we find him again one day when some Greeks came along. Why they came to Philip is a little puzzling, but Philip is a Greek name. It means lover of horses. And uh, they apparently thought that they'd get a better go from uh, from somebody with a Greek name than from somebody else. After all, these twelve were all Jews, and they said to, to Philip, "Sir, we would see Jesus." Now, what do you do in a case like that? Could he bring them to Jesus? Jesus' whole ministry had been spent among Jews. He, he didn't go out teaching Greeks. He'd spent his whole time in Palestine. And all the people in the, in the apostolic band, all this first group were Jews. And all the Jews knew that they were superior to all the Gentiles. And could he bring Gentiles to Jesus? It was unthinkable. But could he turn them away? That was equally unthinkable. And Jesus was kind and welcoming. He didn't turn people away. People came to him. Come unto me, he said, all that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you. He invited all the, the weary and the heavy laden and the downcast. Could he turn Greeks away? That was just as unthinkable. What do you do? Philip didn't know. Well, he went off and said, Andrew, oh man, look, <clears throat> here are some Greeks want to come to Jesus. What on earth do we do? Bring them to Jesus, said Andrew. He's just as consistent as Philip. And so they brought them to Jesus and the matter ended happily. But again, you see, Philip just doesn't know what to do. And then the, the only other time we read of, of Philip, there he is in the upper room, and Jesus is talking, and he speaks of the Father. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. And Philip, 
sitting there wondering what it's all about. And then he butts in. Lord, show us the Father. That's all we want. That's all we want. And he threw down on him the gentle rebuke of Jesus. Philip, have you been with me so long time and yet you don't know me? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And we can be thankful for Philip's interjection for bringing out this important truth. But do you see the consistency right the way through? Philip comes before us as a man who's easily put out of his depth. He's not a tremendous guy like Peter. He is a a very ordinary, almost insignificant person. And that leads me to reflect a little further. Peter was in the twelve and so was Philip. What sort of people were the twelve? Now, supposing that you were put on the spot and were asked to name the twelve. How did you get on? Well, we're outside the Matthew, Mark, Luke, John class. At least in this assembly we can know that people could start with Peter and James and John, people who really were there. And then we would all think of one or two others. We'd sure think of Philip after what we've been through today. And we would reflect on Thomas. Everybody knows Thomas because he was a hard-headed doubter. And we reflect on Judas because he betrayed Jesus. Where do we go from there? Maybe from... Way back we've got some name that sticks in our minds like Lebius, whose surname was Thaddeus. And we've got it not because it means anything to us, but because it's such a nice, euphonious piece of English. But there are very, very few people who left to themselves can go straight through the Twelve Apostles. Why? I think they're hard to remember because quite a few of them weren't memorable men. They didn't leave any remarkable achievement behind them. The church did what it could. It made up all kinds of interesting legends, legends about the whole lot of the twelve. But the church couldn't make them stick. Nobody believed them. And so we, we are left with a group of apostles, some of whom were great men. I think Peter would be great in any company. He was tremendous. John, I think, a different type, a man of of profundity. He's a great man too. But when you get on to Lebius, whose surname was Thaddeus, and people like our friend Philip, I wonder... And I think that that was our Lord's policy. I don't think he sat down and said, now where are the twelve most able men in Palestine? I'll go out after them. I don't think he did at all. I think that the twelve is a good cross-section of God's church as it always has been. Some people with great talents. Some people who were really great men. But most of us haven't great talents. Most of us are very ordinary people. The average Christian is, by definition, average. He's just not beyond it at all. And if I could say it reverently, it wouldn't be much to God's credit if he could take really outstanding people and do great things through them. But when he takes ordinary, insignificant people, people like Philip, people like the lowly ones right through the ages, when he takes people like you and me and makes out of us the very saints of God, Man, that's something. And that's what God's been doing always. He's not dependent on human greatness. He can and does 
do tremendous things through people that this earth counts as insignificant. He's always been doing it. Uh, the early church, uh, while it did have its great leaders and while some of, the, of its members came from the upper strata of society, by and large, came from those strata of society which were not expected to produce leaders. But God did tremendous things through them. God's been doing that kind of thing over and over all through the centuries. I find Philip an enormous comfort. Uh, here is a man that, so far as I can see, was always out of his depth, had no tremendous qualities at all. And he's not just one of those that Christ allows grudgingly into the circle of his followers. Here he is, he's in the twelve. Those great leaders of the Christian church, those ones that have been held in honor by the church right through the centuries. There is Philip. And there he belongs. Don't let anything that I am saying give the impression that I think he ought not to be there. He ought. And I am glad to see him there and I am encouraged. I think that God can take Philip with all his limitations and put him there and use him to God's glory so God can take any of us and use us too to his glory. And so it's all of a piece that Philip didn't find Jesus. I don't think he had the initiative. If Jesus wanted him in this little band, he had to go and get him. And he did. He went out and found him. And he said, follow me. Now a little explanation. Philip was from Bethsaida out of the city of Andrew and Peter, so that they were three hometown boys. Now, Philip mightn't have been very much, but he knew what to do when he came to Jesus. He went off and found Nathaniel. And he said to him, He of whom Moses wrote in the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth, we have found. We have found is something of an overstatement, I guess considering what had happened just before, but nonetheless it's the way any of us would have put it if we'd been in Philip's steps, I guess. Uh, the way he puts it uh, looks as though he and his friend Nathaniel had had a lot of discussions over the scripture. They had wondered about this one of whom Moses wrote in the law. They had wondered about the one of whom the prophets wrote. And so Philip is able to tell Nathaniel that they have found him, and that he's Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Some people, uh, wrong-headedly as it seems to me, use this to indicate that uh, the writer of this gospel knew nothing of the virgin birth, as though Philip, within the, uh, the first few moments of his coming to know Jesus, should have known all the intimate details of the way in which he was born. Now, that seems to me plain ridiculous. Jesus was known legally as the son of Joseph, and so this was the natural way for a man like Philip to express it. Well, that's the way he put it to Nathaniel. Nathaniel is a man about whom very little is known. He turns up in this gospel, but not elsewhere. Um, it is pointed out by some that the word Nathaniel uh, is the uh, Aramaic word for gift of God. They point out that this is the equivalent of the Greek Theodore and also means gift of God. And they suggest that what John is doing here is making up a little story about a, a symbolic figure. This is the man given by God. But there's nothing in the narrative, it seems to me, to point to that. And I see no reason why we should not take Nathaniel as a very real person. Others try and locate him among the twelve. Um, they suggest that... Uh, all the others around this chapter finished in the twelve and Nathaniel must be one. And so they try and identify him with one of the uh, figures mentioned in the list of the twelve in the three earlier Gospels. One I think that comes up as favorite is Bartholomew uh, for a number of reasons. One of them is that Bartholomew is not really a man's name. Uh, Bar is the Aramaic for son of. And Bartholome was a man almost certainly who had another name. Who can tell it might have been Nathaniel. Uh, well, now, if we have to identify Nathaniel with uh, one of the others, then I guess uh, Bartholomew is as good a guess as any. But I don't see any reason why we should. There is nothing in this chapter to indicate that uh, the man was one of the twelve, and I see no reason for supposing that that would necessarily have been so. 
I think Nathaniel that comes before us is nothing other than a friend of Philip's, one who had studied the scripture with Philip, and one to whom Philip naturally turned with the great news that he had come to know the Messiah. Well, Nathaniel wasn't impressed, and uh, Nathaniel said to him, Out of Nazareth, can any good thing be? So far as is known, there wasn't anything particularly bad about Nazareth. It, it wasn't a, a place that had a bad reputation, so that people would not expect anything good to come out of it. It looks to me like small town rivalry. Cana and Nazareth were a couple of villages not so very far apart. It's always difficult to think that there's anything much good coming out of the other village. Good always resides in one's own village. And it looks to me as if it's just this natural small town rivalry here. But it's enough to put Nathaniel off. He doesn't want anything from a man from Nazareth. But Philip says, come and see. Philip didn't know how to argue, but he didn't know that he was, he'd found Jesus. So Nathaniel came. Verse 47, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him. And he says to him, look. Truly an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Nathaniel says to him, Whence do you know me? That's a very interesting reply. Uh, a more guileful person would have modestly, put modestly in quote marks, disclaimed being an Israelite without guile. But not Nathaniel. He was so guileless that he, he wanted to know simply how Jesus knew what sort of a person he was. Guile, incidentally, is a word which uh, is used for uh, things like a bait to catch fish, and then it can be used for a law for all sorts of things. In the Old Testament, it is uh, applied to Jacob, who was a guileful person. And one or two translators have suggested we ought to translate this as, Behold an Israelite in whom is no Jacob. The uh, thought is that the reference to guile points us back to Jacob as he was before God took him over and remade him and gave him the name Israel, Prince with God. Uh, I think that's possibly reading a bit too much into it, but um, I leave the thought with you. You can work it out for yourself. Anyhow, Nathanian inquired how Jesus knew all about this. And Jesus answered him saying, before Philip saw you, while you were, uh, before Philip called you, while you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Which was crystal clear to Nathaniel. About as clear as mud to us. Um, it is known that the fig tree was almost a symbol of home. You know, in the Old Testament, a picture of ideal times is where every man uh, dwelling in his own house under his own vine, his own fig tree. Um, so that the fig tree was usually associated with home. Around this period, the rabbis used the expression fig tree every now and then in such a way that makes it seem that the fig tree was a favorite place for meditation. Um, Palestine wasn't terribly hot. A bit warm on occasions, I guess. It's just as an aside, we generally get the impression that Palestine was... a a very hot country, but I think this arises from the fact that um, the books about Palestine, which have been written in English, have traditionally been written by the English, and for them, it is a hot country, but then they live in a fairly cool place. But Palestine isn't in the tropics. It's in the temperate zone. And Jerusalem is, what, 3,000 feet above sea level? A good deal of the country is elevated. And you don't get it terribly hot in that country. It's a bit warm, but uh, uh, it's, it's not terribly hot. However, in the summer, uh, it got a bit warm indoors, and there was a sad lack of air conditioning, and one thing that people who wanted to study did was to get outside into the shadow of a tree. And a fig tree was a very good tree for that purpose. It has nice leaves and spreads a, a very pleasant shade, and uh, a number of references in the rabbinic writings to people who studied under their fig tree. 
And it looks as though this had been Nathaniel's experience. He had been doing some quiet reading one day under a fig tree, and he had had some interesting experience. The tantalizing thing is that we can't even guess what the experience was. But Jesus knew. And when he said these words to Nathaniel, Nathaniel knew that Jesus knew. And that is the important thing. Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Notice that he addresses him now with the respectful Rabbi, which he didn't use first time up. Then he was just coming to, to see, could any good thing come out of Nazareth? But now, Rabbi, see, what Jesus has said convinces Nathaniel that Philip was right. This is the one that Moses and the prophets wrote about. And so he's ready immediately to accept him. And he greets him with two great titles. You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Son of God is interesting turning up as early as this in the Gospel. John tells us over in chapter 20 that he's written this Gospel that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing may have life in his name. So that he has these two aims before him, to show that Jesus is the Christ and to show that he is the Son of God. And if these things can be shown, that the readers may have life. Well, we have seen how there have been a number of references to the Christ, in one way or another. And here Nathaniel greets Jesus as God's Son. Not a Son of God, but the Son of God. He thinks of him as God's Son in a very special sense, not in the sense in which all men may be regarded as members of the heavenly family. You are the Son of God. I guess we would be inclined to put it the other way around. You are the King of Israel, you are the Son of God, leading up to the climax. But possibly for Nathaniel, Jew as he was, this was climactic. The man who would be king of Israel was close to God in a way that uh, even the Son of God might not be. I'm not sure about that, but I put that out anyway as a suggestion for a Jew. King of Israel was a tremendous title. Now that provokes from Jesus the reply, because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. Actually, that do you believe could be a statement, as I pointed out to you before. There are no punctuation marks in the oldest manuscripts, and maybe what Jesus said was, because I saw you under the fig tree, you believe. Possible way of taking it, but... Whether it's a statement or a question, uh, in either case, it indicates that Nathaniel did in fact believe. I remind you again that this gospel was written that you may believe. And here is the first man who is specifically said to believe. We must assume that Andrew and Peter and Philip had all believed, but it is not said specifically that they did. It is said specifically that Nathaniel believed. And so we see the development of John's great theme. But then Jesus says, you'll see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heaven opened and the angels of God going up and going down on the Son of Man. He truly, truly is a very difficult thing to render into English. It's uh, Amen. The word that we put at the end of a prayer. Somebody utters a prayer on behalf of a congregation and the congregation makes that prayer their own by their Amen. Then it isn't a solo performance but it's a congregational prayer and we're all in it. Now that's the way Amen was used in the first century just as with us. It was used as the congregational response to something uttered by the leader on behalf of the congregation. And I don't think there is any parallel at all to Jesus' way of starting something with Amen, Amen. Um, it certainly is a way of introducing something important as we look through the various passages in the Gospels which are introduced in this way. They are all important, 
I think it's a way of drawing attention to what follows as something on which emphasis is to be placed, and it's a way of vouching for the truth of it. A number of uh, New Testament scholars believe that also <clears throat> we are to see in this uh, some strong expression of Christology. They think that uh, where other people would put an arm in at the end of it, uh, sort of saying this is, uh, this is what uh, I am putting forward, Jesus puts it at the front. And he is, so to speak, associating himself with the words that follow and calling on God uh, to witness that this is true. This may be so, and if so, then we've got an, an interesting illustration of the greatness of Jesus which John is trying to bring out. One small point, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we always get the, the single word, amen, just once. In John, we always get a double, amen, amen, truly, truly, verily, verily, in the old translation. And I think that in this, John has preserved a little trick of speech of Jesus. Right? Now and then in the Gospels, we get that. Now, Martha, Martha, thou art troubled about many things. Uh, Simon, Simon. Satan has desired to have you and sift you as wheat. And I think Jesus did have this habit of, of repeating a word now and then, and that John has picked it up. Truly, truly, I say to you. Anyhow, whatever be the truth of that, this is a way of indicating that uh, the following expression is significant and important, and notice has to be taken of it. You will see the heaven opened and the angels going up and down on the Son of Man. There is, of course, a strong element of the symbolical here, there is, I think, an allusion to the dream of Jacob in Genesis 28, where he saw the ladder set up to heaven and the angels of God going up and going down on it. And the here, instead of the angels going up and going down on the ladder, they're going up and going down on the Son of Man, which surely is a way of saying that the Son of Man is the bridge between heaven and earth. How are we to know heavenly realities? Because in Christ Jesus they are made available to us. It's through him that we see the heaven opened and through him that we have access to heaven, through him that the messengers, the angels, go up and go down. And so Nathaniel is promised that this is but a beginning. As he associates with Jesus, so he will be drawn more and more fully into the heavenly realities. And what is true for Nathaniel is, of course, true for us too. Let's pray for grace to follow these good examples. Dear Father, we thank thee for these men, for Andrew and his companion, for Peter, uh, for Philip, for Nathaniel. We thank thee that they came to know the Lord Jesus Christ and we thank thee for what we can learn from those early encounters. We pray that thou be with us all. We too have come to thee. We've come to know our Saviour, come to know him though we have so many imperfections and so many weaknesses and so many failures. We thank thee that thou dost take ordinary people and transform them. And we pray that we may be encouraged from those that we've been thinking of today and that strong in the strength that thou dost supply, we may go forward to do thy good and perfect will and that we may be found faithful in our day and generation even as they were in theirs. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.